What really inspired you to, to write the book? I mean, we've heard about your journey and so forth, but what was that trigger moment? Um, one was a personal one, you know, my son was very unwell and this was in 2014, he met with an accident and um, I was in Mumbai, he was in Delhi and um, I was talking about this in the morning as well and I had to rush in because he was in the ICU, he'd lost a lot of blood and you know, I was going through this whole upheaval in my mind about am I back, you know, doing selfishly what I like to do and am I not again fulfilling my responsibilities. Um, and it was the longest one and a half hour uh, flight that I've ever been on when I went back to see him. Uh, he became fine, but that those moments of stress and desperation of what am I supposed to do kind of just made me put pen to paper. So that was the biggest trigger. But then there were, you know, a lot of other women who've been coming back to me and talking about similar issues kind of fueled that up as well. Okay. Um, you start your book about talking about uh, clarity and choices. So how did these impact your decisions? So, you know, I talked about one decision and um, uh, I would actually now share stories about other women that I have met. Uh, but I think, you know, clarity is about having a goal post. And so you need to have a milestone about where you're headed. Again, we all know it intellectually, but how many of us really persist towards that mile post? Um, you know, if you don't know where you want to go, anything will take you there. So I think defining that goal post is extremely important. It could be in your personal life, it could be in your professional life, and then finally that drives the choices that you want to make. Um, for me, you know, deciding what I wanted to pursue in terms of further studies was important. It was a very important um, clarity of thought that I had to persist with. And once I decided I wanted to do it, then, you know, whether my parents resisted it or whether, you know, my, you know, extended family didn't think that was the right choice, I persisted with a satisfaction that if it works, the credit is mine. If it doesn't work, the hardship is mine. You've worked across the globe and um, uh, you know, you, you've lived in London, New York, India. What differences have you seen um, impacting women or the working environment or the homemakers? You know, um, I think uh, every geography, there are certain things which are very similar. You know, the whole, uh, the guilt factor about, you know, how do I balance my children and my work always persists, uh, especially for a working woman. And I think, um, you know, very often I've seen uh, in terms of the differences, it's the socio-cultural factors at play. So what may be acceptable in one country, and just as an example uh, of maternity leave, you know, for example, in the U.S., uh, you have a maternity leave of three to four weeks. I don't know where this changed, Judith, but my time, that's what it used to be. Whereas if you look at this part of the world, or say Asia, it will probably be six months. And if you look at Europe, uh, it will probably be a couple of years. Now, some of it is driven depending on, you know, demographic dividends that different countries are looking for. But a lot of it is driven also by sociocultural variables and how people perceive childcare. Um, so I think there are social cultural factors at play. Um, going back to India where I am currently, where I said it's a very patriarchal society, um, there's a much stronger view about, you know, how women need to be at home. And so when a man or a woman comes back, I, mean, I don't cook, I'm not a great cook, but the general expectation is that, you know, she's kind of taking care of the homely chores. And very willingly, by the way. And if, you know, there were times when if my husband was washing dishes and even if my mother was at home, she would find it a bit odd. Um, so I think those expectations are slightly different across geographies. Great. So let's take some maybe questions from the audience. My question is, do you think men have it all? <laughs> I don't know. You know, I would actually put it out to the men out here. But I think, uh, I think no human being has, has it all. But it all depends on how you define that all. And I think, you know, I, whether it's men or women, I think they can all have it all, depending on how you prioritize what that all means for you. All may not necessarily mean being a superhuman, you know, being the best father or the best mother and the best employee or the best son or the best daughter. So how you define your ecosystem will decide whether you have it all. But the power to, of deciding that or exercising that choice rests with you. Very often, you know, whether it's my husband or I, you know, we, we don't kill ourselves if we can't make it to a PTC. Um, we just live with it because then we will have follow-up appointments to school and we'll try and make up for the time that we've lost. Um, the, only, the only point I'd like to make in this whole choice game is that 
in some societies, men have a freedom to exercise a greater choice. And the expectations about you know, juggling different things are different and pro positively more biased towards you know, um, making a career. So having it all, I think they can have it all. So can women, actually. Uh, but define what that means. If uh, we men were to take one single emotion out of the range that women have to make our corporations and uh, our general society a better, more balanced society, what would that one emotion be? It's a very interesting question, actually. Um, you know, I think men are kind as well. And um, they're kind and they're relationship-oriented. Um, but I think, this is my experience, so it's not prescriptive. But in my view, I think that sense of larger compassion uh, would be quite helpful if we can make it more prevalent. I've met men who have it, or men don't, don't have it, and same, but I found women having that in a little more degree. Hi, Anu. Uh, you know, you've talked a lot about the role you played, and, uh, and you, may, you did mention about your husband at appropriate times, so I want to really understand that's what because kind of he's role? Not in the room, so. No, I know, <laughs> I know, which is why I'm, uh, which is why I'm asking the question. My wife's not here too. <laughs> uh, what role did your husband play, and did he have to? While well, you talk about making choices, did he have to give up on certain things that he would have liked to do, uh, given that you were both mobile and you both had, you know, great careers? Yes, he did. I think he had to give up his extensive golf <laughs> to start with, because there were times, especially when I was doing Delhi, London, I think he had to actually really step up in terms of taking over a lot of the day-to-day -day responsibilities. I wouldn't just say motherly responsibilities, starting from what the kids are going to eat. And uh, he was a very popular dad in the mama's network in school because he was in all the WhatsApp groups and all the Facebook groups and you know, he was just very popular. So, but, but I think he had to give up uh, a bit of his social life. He had to give up a bit of his sporting uh, because, and he was happily balancing that because I was traveling a lot more at that point of time than he was. Uh, but that's what we balanced out. And just to make sure that it was balanced out, soon enough after I moved to India, he moved back to London. And then I was not ready to move back because the kids were in high school. So. We've had that, but yes, those compromises were made. Sure, sure. So it's my little attempt, and uh, Rajiv alluded to it uh, very nicely, where, you know, how can we make a difference? Yeah. And I think it's my attempt to make a little difference and uh, feel happy and satisfied about it. Um, you know, I feel very humbled with uh, where, I, where things are with me in my personal and professional life today. By no means, I feel that, you know, this is where I have arrived. I think. I've come a long way, but I've yet got a long way to go. Um, so at this juncture, I just wanted to pause and uh, proceed from, all, from this book, actually go to a project called Mandeshi, uh, which is also sponsored by the Sherry Blair Foundation. Um, it's basically um, going out to the rural, uh, or to the rural landscapes of the villages in India and, doing, and trying to induct women into financial inclusion. So they do financial education, and the reason we chose this particular project is because it was going back to the confidence and the choices which women are making. When I dwelled on it a little, I figured that a lot of, you know, in the villages in India, men actually are not working. Women are doing, you know, smaller jobs and they get the money. It all comes in cash, great banking opportunity, but it all comes in cash and then it's put under the pillow. And then at night, the husband would come home because he wants money to go out and drink and he would typically thrash the woman, take the money, and that's it, and she's gone. So this woman is trying to now just sustain herself and her kids, and she doesn't know how she manages herself. So this project is really going out to those villages, giving them tools, educating them how to deploy their finances. In different ways, it's also helping them get some of the work, and, um, you know, and helping them out to live a better life. So I think if it can improve life for a few women, I genuinely feel my journey would have been fulfilled. Definitely, thank you. I just have a question. Uh, up till now, whatever your experiences were, 
I don't know if you have a daughter, but if you do have a daughter, <coughs> what would your advice be to her? Yeah, I do have a daughter. I have a 17-year-old daughter and I have a 12-year-old son. Uh, she doesn't want any advice from me. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, um, I but would advise... But the still give it, whether they yeah. want it or not. Yeah, no, that was on a lighter note. Uh, but my advice to her would be, you know, she should keep flying. You know, at the stage of life she's in, she should run, she should fall, but she shouldn't stop. Um, because I think, you know, the future is very bright and the sky is the limit. If I were to go back to her age, you know, I would take a lot more risk than I have in my life. And I think maybe because I came from a background which is slightly more conservative, you know, I pursued and saying, okay, well, I have to get the right education, to get the right job. And, you know, there is this concept about, oh, you've got to settle down. So I've got to settle down. Whereas my daughter doesn't come with those strings. And I, so I would want her to fly, take the risk, do what her, you know, heart really wants to do, pursue her passion and make a bigger impact. You know, it's funnily enough, Rajiv and I were talking in the afternoon and I said, today, my daughter starts with how she wants to change the world, you know. I just, didn't, I just didn't even think about it when I was 17. But today she does. And I would just advise her to go out there and change it in her way. Great, thank you. Yes, Rajiv. It's Mike. <clears throat> I guess uh, a lot has been written about this title, Can I Have It All? Yeah. If you Google... Uh, you know, whether it's, um, there, there's, of course, Indra Noe's famous, famous quotes on it. She claims she couldn't have it all. Uh, they've been, there's, there's this public policy head, Anne-Marie Slaughter, who said she can't have it all. And they've been, um, they've been, and of course, Sheryl Sandberg says that she can have it all. And clearly, you, you, you've, joined the, you've joined the group that says that you can have it all. But if, hearing you is very inspirational, and everything that I hear from what you say seems to indicate that this is not a zero-sum game. Yeah. Because it almost leads to a, a gender issue when you hear from a group. Or when you hear a, a lady <coughs> writing a book like this, it almost seems contentious. And my question to you in the afternoon was, does a lady having it all mean that I, as a man, will lose it all? And I, I, I would like to change that question. Clearly, you know, inspired by what you've, uh, what you've, what you've shared with us, uh, the question I have is, it seems like you and your husband have together had it all. And we are talking about a generation of millennials who will increasingly become the relevant proportion of the population in this universe, uh, who are clearly more egalitarian, yeah. far more accepting, extremely ambitious, and like your daughter, uh, out there to change the world. Would you now, after having got the feedback from so many similar groups that you've shared your story with, have called the book, We Have It All? Or would you still want to use the contentious, <laughs> can I have it all? Uh, you know, there's a section where I talk about collaboration. And I have given due credit to my husband in that. But I think this is, this is right now, this is a journey, this is my journey right now. And I do agree. I think if I look at our life together, yes, we've had a lot together. And I think we, yet have, we are yet raring to go further. Uh, but this journey is a reflection of how I had it all. And I think it's written from a woman's lens. And the challenges which I faced are slightly different than what he faced. He came in my life 25 years after I was born. And there, is, there are things that happened in those 25 years as well, which shaped me in a different way. And maybe he was a product of those choices. You know, maybe I just chose him because I knew what I wanted to. So I'll take all the credit right now and said <laughs> I had it all. Um, but yeah, I think uh, he's been a great partner and uh, you know, that's uh, why we are happily married. So. I know you spoke about um, the crossroads or the three M's as you call them, yeah. uh, marriage, maternity, mobility. So what is your advice to women um, on how to, you know, split their time, segregate uh, duties and so forth between home, work, family? You know, it's very personal in my view and uh, it's an often debated topic in, in the organizations, you know, how do you do work-life balance and I think it's very personal. And the scales vary depending on how you're prioritizing your work. So there are days where I'm 100% at work, which means I'm there 9 to 9 and there will be days I'm working from home. 
um, you know, as I said, you know, my, my family is in Delhi and I kind of work out of Mumbai, which means I travel back and forth. So there are times I'll work out of home, there are times I'm in office, but the point is I try and make it work. And there will be days where my children need me more. So I think it's, it's about finding that balance for yourself. You know, I'm acutely aware that what might work for me may not work for somebody else because their prioritization or what they feel is important may be slightly different than what I may feel is important. So it's about finding that balance and not trying to get that whole 50-50, um, you know, of uh, trying to strike that 50-50 balance, maybe 70-30 for some, maybe 80-20, maybe 90-10 for some. I have another question. Um, yeah. I think in today's world, we all suffer from the fact that a lot of people live on a plane. One partner or both partners are, are always traveling. You yourself uh, have dual homes, right? I mean, you're based in Mumbai, your family's in Gurgaon. So how do you manage to stay connected with the family and still lead a family, a quote unquote, holistic yes. family? You know, I'm a bit of a virtual mom. So I have leveraged technology to the hilt. And so, I, you know, there's a bit of discipline, there's a bit of perseverance, um, uh, a lot of friendship with mothers and mother-in-laws, which try and support you when you're traveling. Uh, but my day really, I mean, I get to office and, um, you know, I'll call my kids when they're, if I'm not, if I'm traveling, I'll call them up in the morning when they're leaving for home, we'll have a chat on FaceTime or Skype. When they come back, I'll call them, check on what's going on with their homework. Um, you know, before I leave home, I would typically sit down with my housekeeper, plan the week and how that's going to work. Um, so I think it's about that constant interaction and making sure that, you know, whether it's your family or your children, they don't, they know that they can talk to you at any point of time. You know, it's, it, it's a different thing that when I'm in the, my most critical meeting, my son would call and say, can I play PS4? you know, which is banned in the house, but he just knows exactly when mom's walked into the most important meeting and let me call now because she won't say no, she just wants me off her back. Uh, but I think just remaining connected, whether it's phone calls, whether it's FaceTime, whether it's, um, you know, planning family holidays, weekends, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit rigid about my weekends because I travel so much. So I try and spend Saturday, Sunday with, uh, with my children. Um, I'm available on calls, but I try not to travel unless it's very, very critical. But I think a little bit of discipline, a little bit of technology, a little bit of support from extended family can help sort out things. I was talking to a few of our guests earlier before we started, and um, I think it was Mr. Mani who mentioned that, you know, their daughters have broken through the glass ceiling. Um, and what is your impression? I mean, what makes women who have really made it to those male-dominated boardrooms uh, special? I think one is their sense of clarity and saying, I need to be here. Because when you're clear about what path you're taking, um, somewhere that, you know, the, the universe will conjure around you to make it happen. So I think it's their clarity and it's also their perseverance um, about you know, not bowing, bowing down to the odds which they might be faced with. A lot of women who are pushing through the glass ceiling, and in some ways I do think it's cracking a bit, but who are yet pushing through the glass ceiling are challenging certain norms, which creates a certain amount of discomfort. I have a lot of, you know, mid to senior level women who come and have a chat with me about what they feel comfortable or what they don't feel comfortable. Um, and very often, it's just the unconscious biases which are working in the work environment, which becomes a bit of um, a problem for them. So I think just challenging that and changing certain mindset, that takes an effort. Uh, you know, I've gone through it myself sometimes where, you know, people don't like the way you work or, you know, are looking for a style which is very, very typical to, you know, the larger uh, set of people who are in the boardroom. Uh, and you may be different. Different is not necessarily bad, you're just different. And explaining that and trying to be more inclusive or trying to make the working environment more inclusive makes them really special as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Should I take some more questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, talking about extended family, how large a part would your parents have played in helping you achieve this balance between oh, your huge. professional life and... Huge. I mean, after the college uh, incident, uh, uh, they've been nice to me, uh, but uh, I think when we have been doing these um, dual country or two city uh, kind of things, they've played a huge role. Um, they don't live with me, but every time 
uh, my husband and I are out, they live close by, so they would they just come in and out of the house, which for me as a mother, you know, mentally is very comforting because I know my children are in good hand. And uh, the only problem is, you know, they kind of have them wrapped around their little fingers, which they get away with a lot more than they would when I'm around. Uh, but you're comforted that they are safe, they're in good hands, and they're being taken care of. So they, I owe them a lot, uh, you know, for what I am today. And is that something you would do as a parent too? Oh, absolutely. You know, I understand what it takes. And I think, you know, actually you raise a very good point, because my mother was working. Oh, exactly. What I yeah, she was a doctor. Yeah. So, so I think somewhere she understood the challenges. She might have had her own views about why I was doing this and, you know, my husband's doing well, so why would I just want to stick around in London? Why don't I come back with him? She'd have her views, but they were always well-meaning. Mm -hmm. It wasn't with any, with any other intent. But she also understood the pain of a working mother and what I would be going through. And sometimes I'll be very candid, and again, going back to the, since Sandeep is not in the room, that I would trust my parents much more with the kids than with my husband because sometimes he won't know how to deal with it. So they, I owe them a lot. Did you at any point uh, feel that you want to, you actually took your resignation letter and decided that you actually went up and said, okay, this is what I'm going to give in now since you went through so much in life. And, and yeah. if your parents, um, did your parents try to convince you at any one point that you were going the wrong way? Um, you know, I look like any career, you know, sometimes you go through a down phase. So I have contemplated, you know, making a different choice, i.e. resigning from what I was doing. But it was never driven just by the personal circumstances. It was always driven about what I wanted at work and was it worthwhile me persisting this journey. So, you know, sometimes you want a job very badly. Sometimes you want a promotion really badly and it doesn't come your way. And sometimes you say, well, it's okay, you know, but sometimes you feel it was unfair. And for me, that sense of unfairness sometimes has triggered me to that point. And what held me back were less my parents, because they're less engaged with what I do, but really the mentors at work, who would say, hey, hold on, it's okay. You know, it isn't the end of the world. You know, look at it in a different perspective. You might have lost this, this is what you gain. But I think in that moment, uh, you know, when you lose something or very coveted promotion or very coveted job, it's hard because you feel you've worked really hard at it. And that's when you need these mentors around you. Mm -hmm. And I'm really grateful that I had a couple of them. Thank you. I have one question. Sorry. Sorry. I have one question. In your initial journey of, um, of life, um, how difficult was it to go you know, to break through the, um, the change of conservativeness that does not only involve, say, your parents or your in-laws, but, you know, an extended society at large, as a woman? You know, at, actually, it wasn't so tough in the initial phase when I was at, I'm talking just on a career basis, you know, yeah. junior to mid-level. It was actually easier then, because if you look at what's happening around the world, more women in workforce, more women in educational institutes. I think what I found tough was when I reached the middle career phase. Not because of maternity or marriage or mobility, but the perception around you starts to change. So if you want to you know, persist a path which is, um, if I may say, male dominated, or you want to do things which traditionally are not what women are seen to be doing, yeah. that's when it got tougher. Yeah. My challenge was, I, it got tougher with both men and women. And sometimes I was a bit lost because I didn't know where I belong. You know, I didn't belong to the men club, but I didn't belong to the women club either. So where did I belong? And that was the tough bit. Okay. Um, so I think I had to transcend over a gender debate. And I had to come out and say who I was and connect with different people um, at, a, how do I say, at an individual level. And yeah, as I said, I, maybe I was fortunate. There were a couple of people who helped me during that journey. You know, sometimes I was confused. The clarity didn't come through what I wanted to do. Um, and they would kind of, you know, guide you through. But they would guide you through because they believed in you. But I found it tricky at the middle level phase, not at the junior level. And were you ever pulled down by guilt? Oh, many times. You were? Many times. Okay. Um, and so how did you deal with that situation or that um, emotion? 
Yeah, many times. You know, um, you know, I was talking about an incident in the morning with uh, with a group of people in Dunya. I said, you know, there was a time when um, I was uh, coming back from Delhi to London, and my seven-year-old son, you know, tugged on my, uh, you know, dress and said um, he didn't want to say, "Mama, don't go," but he turned around and said, "You know what? I'm not feeling too good. I'm just getting this very bad feeling in my heart," and uh, he was just going through a separation anxiety. Yeah. Right, and yeah. you get overwhelmed with guilt at that stage. You know, you start asking whether you're being very selfish. But I think, you know, at that stage, I did need somebody to tell me it'll be okay. Correct. You know, I had to understand that my mother is there and my husband is there, and you know what? I could be working out of India, and even if I was traveling for any other reason, he may have gone through it. So how do I manage him? And I think. I had to learn to compensate for it, not by just buying him his PS4 games, but uh, I think by spending quality time when I was with him. But there were enough of those tough moments. I talked about children falling unwell. Yeah. You know, I talked about my son going through an accident. I mean, he is an accident-prone kid, as you know. I'm not talking about my daughter as much, but um, so those are moments where you question whether you're on the right path. But I realized, you know, when you know you're comforted by the presence of, you know, your extended family and close others, and you continue. And now, when I look back, you know, I don't feel guilty about what I did. I feel actually I did did the right thing. And as I said, you know, when my kids feel proud about what I do, I think, you know, I got it right in some way. So you basically believe in um, focusing and following what you want to do, irrespective of the emotions that you're being pulled down with. And ultimately, it does turn out in the well, manner. Well, you know, it's sometimes not that straightforward. I, I was just referring to guilt. Now, if supposing, you know, there is something very crucial happening at home, like the weekends, mm -hmm. there would be moments where I would take off and go out. So I think it isn't always saying, okay, I just want to do this irrespective of what's happening around me. I think you've got to be pragmatic. I think there are times where things are more important at work, and you know this shall pass, and there will be times where come what may, you know, I will be at home because that's the more important event happening in my daughter's or my son's life. And sure. I would expect some empathy at work. Sure. So I think you kind of find the right balance. But I'll be honest, what's happened is over a period of time, you know, when you work for 20 years, you <coughs> kind of also start to garner um, that credibility. And I think it might have been slightly difficult if I persisted that and saying, oh, I want to be at home for a period of time after five years of working. But after 20 years of working and I feel that, you know, I've treaded a path and people know what I can do, it's become far easier. I, you know, I think it's important, but I think the real driver was, you know, your own self-belief in what you wanted at home or what you wanted outside. I think there were times when, you know, as I was talking to, uh, to her earlier saying, you would take certain decisions and I would say, am I a draconian mother? You know, am I not, am I too selfish? Am I just not doing this right? And you go through those moments. And you know, people are looking at you and saying, this is strange, you know, you left little kids. And you do go through those moments of self-doubt. And then you work it out. You talk to people. As I said, you know, I would talk to who else would I talk to? I would talk to my partner. I would talk to my mother. I would talk to my extended family. So I think you would. There will be people around you who will always have a view, both at work or otherwise. Even if you're at home, I think people will have a view what you do at home. Right? And you can't let that always influence you. Appreciation always helps, and criticism is something you take in your stride and you learn from it. So, you know, I'd worked across the world, and um, there was a moment where I was doing a cultural transition into Europe, for example. And for me, you know, if you worked in New York or Asia, it's a very different culture, whereas the Europe culture is much more subtle. And I didn't get it right you know, a couple of times where I would say things which would be inappropriate, something which would be construed um, okay in one culture is considered rude in a different culture. You know, a small word like, or not small, but a word like interesting. You know, if you're coming from New York or you're coming from India, it's okay, it's interesting, means yeah, you know, maybe something. Well, in UK, it would be dubious, right? So, for me to even understand those little subtleties was a learning and I did not get it right. You know, I would walk into presentation, you think you talk in English, but the English you speak in different countries is also different. Words mean different things. So it was a journey, and I didn't get it right, and it impacted me professionally in terms of goals I was trying to achieve in the, time, in the way the relationships were made. But I learned from it. 
the good part was I learned from it and then I resurrected in terms of how I make it work and I did last for eight years in Europe. So hopefully we finally got it right. As a woman, um, I think, um, you know, I remember when I was working um, in, in banking, for example, um, typically during the financial crisis, there were discussions which were happening. And I remember, in fact, uh, there's an incident which just came to my mind. The first time when I took over the role, um, actually, you know, some people didn't take me seriously. I, I, I went in to meet a few senior managers and I was told, well, okay, you know, we'll meet you. And it's like, okay, she's one, she's doing HR, second, she's a woman, so maybe we'll just, you know, we'll take our time, but not right now. And my own feeling was maybe I wasn't taken that seriously at the onset. I have no idea whether it was biases, it was prejudices, it was something else, I don't know. But I know that it took me a few months to cut through that iron fortress by going shoulder to shoulder on every key project with the business heads. You know, it took me to understand how the banking world works, you know, and at some level understanding their business better than them, if not equally good than them. The good part was that it did break. And, you know, finally you were in the camp and you were in the fortress. And then it didn't matter whether you're a man or a woman, you were just treated as equal in terms of the pressure and what's coming your way. So I think, you know, I've gone through that journey as well, but once broken through it, I could only say be careful for what you ask because after that there was this flood of demands which comes your way, which was ex exciting as well at a different level. Thanks, Anna, it was very inspiring. With the benefit of hindsight today, would you have done anything differently on this journey to break through the glass ceiling quicker and in a more easy fashion and to have it all in, a, in an easier manner? I'm thinking. Um, I could actually. I think I would have, you know, I've, I've had a very um, vertical career. So I chose to be in psychology and chose to be in HR. I would have had a diversity of experiences, which I haven't. And somewhere I feel it might be slightly late in my life to do it, maybe not. Um, but that's what I would do differently. Because I think somewhere moving around countries shaped my thinking differently in the way I look at life and how I work. And I felt that maybe if I did, you know, some other uh, roles outside HR, it might have shaped my thinking further and would have given me a little more holistic perspective to break the ceiling much faster. I know during your journey, uh, when you worked with banks and corporations which are considered hard-nosed, did you ever get a feeling that uh, you were becoming a lesser woman because profits were you know, involved and hard decisions had to be made? And leading from that question, do you believe that if we had more women in corporations, maybe at the decision-making uh, levels, uh, we would have gentler corporations, more aware corporations? Sorry, can you repeat the last question, the second part? If we had more women on the decision-making uh, levels, would we have more caring, more gentler, more aware corporations? So the first question when I was working with the so-called hard-nosed bankers was I becoming less of a woman. Uh, I don't think so personally, because I think who I am, I, you know, I continue to be that. I evolve myself in terms of my skill set, my outlook. But I think the perception around people changes. And what happens is that depending on which business environment you work, you have to adopt a certain style in the culture to make things work. If I'm working in the investment banking part of the business, there's a certain language or there's a certain way of communicating. You know, you just get straight to the point. You do not, you know, go, you do not talk about multi options because time is of essence. People move much faster. So they want to think, they want you to think quickly on your feet and execute. Um, so I think you adopt that style because that is the demand of the role that you're doing, which is not saying necessarily I changed myself. I was actually embracing flexibility to suit to what my business heads needed at that point of time. But I think at some point of time I felt. You know, some people felt that it's great, she's able to do it. Some people felt, oh, maybe it's not. Because, you know, that may not be the very natural style which a woman may display. And which, you know, read as, you know, more nurturing and more caring. She doesn't need to be on her feet all the time. So it depends on how people perceive it. 
the question is whose perception matters and Let's say you were to lay off, lay off 100 people yes. in a bank. Yes. Uh, Business-wise, maybe it makes sense. Yes. Uh, we have to look at the bottom line, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you still felt that those 100 people have families. Yes. Uh, that you you need to do whatever you can to preserve their jobs or to continue with their livelihood. And then did you feel, oh, should I be taking the corporate angle in terms of the bottom line, or should I be looking at you know, the livelihood of these people, and then you are stuck in this uh, decision. Like any, any of those situations, my experience and my live experience, because I've gone through a lot of these restructuring, that, that bit, actually men and women tend to think alike. Because very often those tough decisions, and I've, when we went through that rigmarole, it's not lost on us about what is going on. And we have to be very, very humane about such exercises as and when they're carried out in any organization. I think what, as a woman, I brought to the table was the way I manage it in terms of the compassion that I'm bringing around that and the way I talk about it. The emotions which I felt that some of my business heads were going through were very similar, very similar. And to be very candid with you, you know, when we go through these restructuring, we first look at, is your sole bread earner? You know, is there somebody unwell in the family? You know, is there any other calamity this person is going through? And they, very often, we would take a very collective decision that let's not do that because we are actually, you know, maybe breaching a line of humanity here rather than doing what's right for the business. But that has to be a collective decision. I think what maybe I brought to the table at that point of time is how I handle it in a compassionate way because somewhere people relate to a woman better in those scenarios because they just can be a little more comforting. So that was helpful, actually. That was quite helpful. Uh, Anu, uh, this side, please. Yeah, sorry. A uh, very inspiring story. Um, really loved it. Uh, you said in your talk that you don't plan beyond two years. But uh, I'm going to ask you a hypothetical question. 10 or 15 years from now, what do you see yourself as? Oh boy, uh, yeah, I don't really plan for and, and, and your family, where you want your children to be, uh, will you still be married to Sandeep or so on? <laughs> for 10 to 15 years, I think I'd yet be working. I would be doing what I love most, and uh, which will be some parts of my work. I'm not sure I'll be doing what I do today, but in some way, I don't see myself yet at just being at home and I, I you know I would just reiterate there's nothing being wrong about being at home but I think for me work has become a very integral part of who I am so who I am will remain where she is in different ways I will be part of the corporate world whether with a full-time job depending on how physically fit I am or not uh, but I would be working for sure with a few grandchildren here and there so. <laughs> Ms. Anna, thank you so much for the inspiring talking. You mentioned about uh, make a plan, and uh, you said that don't uh, plan for short, don't plan for long, uh, plan for medium. So why and uh, how do you plan? For You mentioned 18 months to 24 months, right? Yeah. Thank you. You know, very long term, and as a, for me, long term is like think, five to 10 years, because there are too many variables in life. And you know, initially, I might have been thinking five to 10 years, but things change and the environment is changing at such a pace that you might have planned, but you, you know, you may not know what's happened. Very short term because you know, you may not have given yourself enough chance to see how some of the decisions pan out. And you might be taking very quick calls on decisions if you don't give it the optimum amount of time. So I think two to three years typically tends to work better because there's enough time. But if it's not working, you can cut your losses and do something different. Also for me, planning in terms of my professional life has always been not just looking at the next role, but looking at the role after that. So that kind of keeps it going like a chain. So every time I've made my career choices, I'm looking at what am I going to do after that. And you know, so, so you know, it kind of gives me a direction, uh, but not making it very rigid. And that's been the way I've planned my career throughout. Thank I know I have uh, one last question for you. Sure. So if you look at um, anyone's ecosystem, especially a woman, I mean, you've got work or homework, you've got family, you've got friends, you've got fitness, you've got me time. So can you really have it all? 
You're asking me or <laughs> telling me? <laughs> <laughs> is it really possible to have it all? I think it is. And depends on how you define that order. Um, and as I you know, spoke about it a little earlier, it's about prioritizing and how much time you want to spend on this. I think you would be being unfair to yourself if you're saying I'm going to be equally distributed in all of these things. There will be days where you, know, you will feel frustrated about, you know, I wanted to do this and I haven't been able to do it. But if it's happening too consistently, my view on that is that then maybe somewhere the balance hasn't got right, whether you know, you're spending too much time at work. So I think it's, it's, it's a bit about balancing what you want. So if you want to do work, you want to go for a class, you want to be at home with the kids, you've got to plan for it and you've got to prioritize how much time you're going to give it. And more importantly, stick to it. Great. So thank you very much, Anu. It's Thanks. been a delightful uh, session with you. And uh, thank you all for, for being with us. Um, please join us for some refreshments. And we have Anu's book outside also, and she can also sign it uh, accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. Dunya. We do things differently.